So our guest today is Brad Kirkman. Um, he is the General H. Hugh Shelton Distinguished Professor of Leadership in the Department of Management, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship in the Poole College of Management at North Carolina State University. He received his PhD in Organizational Behavior from the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His research interests um, are on leadership, international management, vi virtual teams, and um, work team leadership and empowerment. He is the author of the book 3D Team Leadership, A New Approach for Complex Teams, published by the Stanford University Press in 2017. And he has conducted research, presented papers, and taught in several countries, including Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Canada, Dubai, England, Finland, France, Israel, Mexico, the Netherlands, the People's Republic of China, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the United States. I've only been to five of those countries, so Brad, next time you're uh, heading out of town, you let me know. Um, that would be really great. And I just want to say that uh, if, if you guys have um, a minute to, after the webinar, um, take a look at Brad's um, uh, Google Scholars profile. I mean, it's really, really phenomenal stuff on there. I, I can't wait to dive more into this, um, to some of the work that you've been putting out there. So thanks so much for being here. And um, I will turn it over to you, Brad. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, listing all those countries made me kind of sad because I'm, we're not traveling now. So I'm kind of sort of feeling a little down about it, but we'll, we'll get back to it, I'm sure. And I want to thank Christine and Christine for uh, inviting me to share some ideas with you uh, about uh, 3D team leadership uh, from my book. I, um, I'll give you some high level uh, overview kind of stuff from the book. And then I may, I'll ask you kind of throughout the session, if you would keep your uh, chat function handy, because I've got some questions I want to ask you guys in terms of um, your responses to some of these questions. Uh, and then I'll save time at the end for uh, questions. We can do questions through video as well. So we'll use all the different tools on, on Zoom today. Um, as Christine said, that's kind of my back background summary. Um, I just wrapped up serving as department head um, for the Department of Management um, for the last eight years. And I always say, you know, I was the department head of the Department of Management, and most of the folks that worked for me had PhDs in management. So my job was to manage 20 people who had spent basically their entire lives studying and researching and writing about and forming very strong opinions about what good management is. And if you know anything about people, uh, there were 20 different ideas about what good management is. So. Um, I would call that probably herding cats, uh, which is kind of a cliche, kind of getting cats to go in one direction. But um, having wrapped that up and returned full time to research and teaching has been uh, uh, great for me um, starting in June. So thanks again. So the, the reason that we decided to write this book um, is that most of the books that were out there on teams, leading teams, were really written about what, what I call yesterday's teams. And by that, when you look at this slide and you look at the characteristics of teams, uh, on the side here, and we compare yesterday's teams to today's teams, you can basically see very quickly that today's teams are unrecognizable um, just in the last 10 to 15 years. And some of the differences are pretty extreme, right? So in the past, teams are relatively stable. People were on them for a long time. Today, people are coming and going on and off teams constantly. Um, in the past, people were on maybe one, two teams maximum. We have people in our book that are on 10, 12, 15 teams at the same time. Same with leaders. Leaders are leading more than one team these days. Um, in the past, teams were long-term, ongoing, permanent type teams. Today, they can be very, very short, uh, ad hoc, one day, one week type teams. I'll talk about interdependence more um, in a second. In the past, it was pretty clear who was and who is not on teams. Today, it's kind of hard to tell because the boundaries are very fuzzy. Um, and yes, I will. I can, I can release these slides to you guys for sure. And then yesterday's teams, mostly face-to-face. -face. Most interaction occurred face-to-face. -face. Today, they're very virtual or some combination of face-to-face -face and virtual. Actually, we're all virtual now. And then composition. Uh, more and more teams are global and multicultural. So when you take a look at the slide and you say, yeah, teams are not anything like what they were in the past, there weren't really many books out there that talked about today's team. So that's why I wrote the book, really focusing on 
the teams that look like what's on the right side of that slide there. Uh, there's the book and I wanted to introduce my co-author Brad Harris. Brad was my PhD student when I was working at Texas A&M and he just recently received uh, tenure uh, at Texas Christian University and I was thinking the other day when your former PhD students start becoming tenured professors at other universities, you know, you got a little, you got a little age on you, the gray hair is coming in. Um, I don't, I don't know what you guys think about the cover of the book. When Stanford first sent me the book cover, I was a little taken aback. I wasn't really sure what to make of it. I mean, I knew it was origami, but I was wondering what that piece of origami had to do with teams. And I was also wondering what that piece of origami or had to do with leadership. Because when you call your book team leadership, you want the figure to suggest something about one or perhaps both of those terms. But I, I talked to Stanford about it and they said, you know, well, the different colors and patterns represent um, the diversity you talk about in your book because you talk a lot about the power of diverse teams and harnessing diverse teams. So we wanted to capture that. I was like, okay. And then they said, well, origami starts out as kind of like a relatively uninteresting two-dimensional piece of paper, but with a lot of hard work, creativity, ingenuity, um, the artists create something beautiful out of that piece of paper, something more 3D. And they said, that's what you talk about in your book, that leaders take teams that are struggling, they're not very successful, and with hard work, ingenuity, creativity, they turn these teams into beautiful, high-performing teams. So um, once it was all explained to me, I kind of got it, but I'm still, I don't know, I'm, I'm not totally in love with it. I had another idea for the cover. This was my idea. And I thought that says a lot more about 3D. And then I thought if you put the cover, if you made the cover like three-dimensional and you put a pair of those like 1950s three-dimensional glasses in the back of the book, and then you could peel them off. And then, and the, that took about two seconds for Stanford to start, people started laughing and said, yeah, we don't, we don't do that. So this is, this is the cover. This is the cover we have. Um, before I go too much further, we can use chat for this. Um, I would like to get a sense of what are your specific challenges um, trying to lead and then also be a member of today's team? So given that slide about all that team complexity that we're facing today, um, what sort of things do you see get in the way of team success? What are the biggest barriers or challenges that tend to get in the way of team performance? Uh, egos, Aaron says definitely egos are, are an issue. Uh, individual goals, yep, sometimes they're not compatible with team goals. People are too busy, yep. Um, getting people to follow through, yep, on their commitments to the deadlines. Lack of clarity on what decisions are based on, who makes them, communication, especially now with global and virtual. Uh, hierarchies, territories, yep. Uh, the makeup of the team not always thoughtfully constructed, that's true, yeah. Who's on the team is, is important. Preconceived notions of the most important discipline. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big one. Lack of communication about roles. Yep. Developing team camaraderie in a virtual world. That's been a, a, a really big challenge, especially lately. It's always been there. But since we, I guess for the first time in the history of business, we've shifted from some mixture of face-to-face -face and virtual to almost completely virtual. And it's really thrown a lot of us for a loop in terms of figuring out how to do some of this stuff. Building consensus, yep. Leaders' vision might not be aligned with members. Communication again. Leaders unprepared to lead. Hierarchy, boundaries, yeah. So I would say everything you captured there, um, we talk about in the book in, in more detail. Uh, I won't, won't have a chance to get to all that today, but those are very common. The ones you list there are the ones that many executives, business people, my MBAs, uh, the science teams I work with uh, face a lot of these challenges. So those are very, very, very common. Uh, the book itself starts out with the story of a woman named Anna. And Anna works for a high-tech firm based in San Jose, California. She's a divisional vice president and she leads and is a member of many, many different teams. I'll show you what Anna's primary team looks like. So this is the team that she spends the most time leading and working with. It's a new product development team. And there are the members and their various locations around the world. And the times indicate uh, if she wanted to have a synchronous like Zoom type meeting, that's the time at which those individuals would need to be up and on the call. So you can see that somebody is always pretty much inconvenienced. I mean, she can rotate those times to some degree, 
but again, two or three people are going to be um, working at times that you know aren't quite um, normal or, or certainly ones that we don't want to work on. And I always say, if this were Anna's only team, is this was her 100% of her responsibility was just leading this team, her life would be very busy. She would be uh, in a very complex work situation. But as we said, we're talking about today's teams. So this is not Anna's only team. Anna has other teams, um, including she's the ad hoc leader of a global virtual community of practice that basically is in place to generate best practices for writing code uh, with 10 core members and then quite a few uh, peripheral members that come and go based on their interest. She's also, by virtue of her title, a member of her company's senior management team. She's also a member of a multi-company consortium in her industry. And if that weren't enough, she's also a member of two to four company-specific project teams at any given time. These are sh more shorter, more focused teams, life cycles of several weeks to several months. And then members can share leadership depending on the project content. So I think what I've heard from people who've read the book is when they get to the, to the first five pages, they feel out of breath and they feel a little tense because um, basically Anna's life is consumed by teamwork. And a lot of the folks that I work with and teach say, you know, Anna is me. That's my life. I'm trying to juggle and prioritize. All these things are coming at me um, in different directions at different times. So it's really difficult. But this is really the, the complex world of teaming that we live in. The other thing that makes team leadership different from leading a single individual, like a single direct report, or leading a group, I'll talk about teams versus groups in a second, is that I always say that being a team leader is kind of like walking a tightrope, or in this case, kind of like trying to balance a seesaw. You're trying to strike a balance between these various seemingly intractable tensions, right? So you know that saying there's no I in team? That's a horrible, but there's a me if you rearrange the letters. I think it's a very dangerous corporate slogan. There's no I in team. Of course, there's, there are I's in teams. There's as many I's as there are individuals. So it's a leader's responsibility to work with and motivate and lead the I's in his or her team. But it's also a leader's job to focus on the team as a whole, the team's identity, the team's goals. And if you go too far down either side of that, you're going to be in trouble. If it's all about the eyes, people won't even feel like they're on a team, right? I'm not even sure why he's calling this or she's calling this a team. If you go too far down the right-hand side and it's all about the team, uh, people are going to feel underappreciated. They're going to feel undervalued and they're going to wonder about what's, what's going on with them. So again, the notion here is to strike a balance. Um, we do want, typically want members to support one another, to have a healthy sense of support in their team but they also need to be able to feel safe enough to speak up, disagree, and have conflict. And so again, your job as a leader is to build a healthy climate of supportiveness, but not so much that they can't speak up and disagree because you're going to end up in a groupthink type situation. So again, it's a balancing act. Uh, focusing on performance and also failure. Um, the research would show that we learn much more from failure than we do from success. The same is true for companies, right? We get complacent. Um, too much success can lead to a sense of, oh, I got this, I don't need to learn anything else. And so it's important that leaders allow a little bit of room for failure, not too much, or you're gonna get fired. Um, but again, you strike the right balance between success and learning from failure to be key. The fourth one is really about um, empowerment, how much authority the leader has versus how much the team members have. There's a balance there as well. And then the ones in bold are the ones that are really more focused on today's teams. And we had examples in our a book of a, a leader being at a team meeting that he or she is leading. And then they finish that meeting and they run to another meeting where they're a member of the team, not the leader. And they just take over. They take over the meeting as if they were the leader of that team. And the, leaders, the actual leader is sitting there going, what are you doing? You're not the leader of this team. So how do, mem how do people balance their team leadership versus their team membership roles. Also a bit of a delicate ba a balancing act. Um, we know and we're feeling this today that people have a need for belongingness. Face-to-face -face interaction is so important. And I think this situation that we're in now has really shown us that, how important that face-to-face -face contact is. But we also have a need for virtual teamwork. So a, a question I get quite often is, how often should I get my virtual team members face-to-face -face for interaction. Certainly would try to do that at the beginning of a team's life cycle and then maybe periodically through the year when we can get back to that. So again, 
once things return to hopefully normal, um, leaders will need to think again about how much face-to-face -face versus virtual teamwork they need. And then lastly, with members coming and going so much on the team, you've got another balancing act. So when you have new people come onto your team, you wanna leverage their fresh perspectives, new ideas, but you also wanna maintain team cohesion and unity. So how do leaders strike a balance between bringing on new members and leveraging their knowledge, but also maintaining this sense of cohesion and unity? So, and this is only a partial list. This is not a complete list of all the different tensions, but hopefully looking at just this list, you can sit back and say, yeah, now I see why team leadership is such a complicated thing and, and why we're still talking about it and still doing research on it and still learning things about it because it is very, very complex. Given all that complexity, and I typically use the acronym VUCA, which I think came from the Army War College originally, but it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's pretty much, and it's gotten much more complex uh, with COVID, but that's pretty much the business world we live in, right? It's a, it's a VUCA world, it's very complex, very dynamic, always changing. So I'd ask you in the chat, if, if, if I'm arguing that today's world is, is a VUCA world and we're living in a VUCA world of teams, what's the one thing that a leader needs to be able to do to survive and thrive in a VUCA world of teams? What do you think? What's the one thing you better make sure you're able to do if you're gonna survive and thrive in a VUCA world? Bethany says learn for sure. Uh, Jessica says you better be able to listen. Uh, Andrea says flexible. Yeah, flexibility and adaptability, I would say would be near the top of the list. Uh, the ability to improvise, embrace the growth mindset for sure. Uh, empathy, communication, agility, balance, reflection, and moving forward for sure. Asking the right questions. Yeah, sometimes we don't do that well enough. And then, yeah, Allison, take some time for yourself, right? You have to. So I would say all of those things are critical for being a leader of a team in a VUCA world. In the book, we suggest that one thing stands above all the other ones, and that's focus. And when I get, when I tell my groups that, that the, that the secret is focus, they're like, typical reaction is, oh, really? You just wrote a whole book and that's the answer? Focus? Thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing. Um, wow. Should have been more complex. But it's not just about focus. It's knowing what to focus on. And I would take that a step further and say what to focus on when. Because we don't have infinite amounts of cognitive and emotional and physical energy, right? We, we don't. We're, we have finite amounts of those. And so the ability to prioritize and focus on the right thing at the right time is really the essence of what I'm going to call 3D team leadership. So all the things you said in the chat are true. If, if I run an elevator and I was going up, say, 10 or 12 floors and someone asked me what my book was about, which has never happened, sadly, I, I'm waiting. Sometimes I hold the book up in an elevator, like maybe they'll ask me what my book is. Just, it's never happened. But if they did, and I had about 10 floors, I would say a team is actually not one thing. It's three things. There are three important elements in a team that a leader has to be aware of. One, the eyes in the team, of course, there are eyes in team. The team as a whole, that's obvious because it is a team. And then maybe not so obvious are the sub teams within an overall team. So many teams today have sub teams within the overall team that also had to have to be led and managed. So the, the reason we call it 3D, three dimensions, is that there are three dimensions that leaders must attend to to make the overall team successful. And so uh, this is a, a graphic kind of depiction of what it looks like. I actually drew this picture in Microsoft PowerPoint and because Stanford gave me uh, seven figures, uh, not a million dollars, seven figures, like figures for the book. So I drew this and I sort of rushed it because I thought that Stanford would have like a set of graphic artists that would take my rudimentary childlike drawings and turn them into, nope, that's in the book, just like that. Even the lines don't come together where I got lazy and it didn't seem to mind. So anyway, graphically speaking, you've got nine individuals in this team and there are three sub teams within the team 
and then there's the team as a whole. And in our work with literally thousands of leaders, we found that most were good at leading one of these dimensions. Uh, some were good at leading two of these dimensions. Rarely did we find a leader that was able to manage all three of these dimensions equally well. So one of the big um, uh, areas of the book that we focus on is teaching leaders how to lead each one of these dimensions equally well, and also knowing when to focus on which dimension more so than others. So for example, we found some leaders that were really great one-on-one -on -one coaches and mentors but they really struggle with the team leadership piece. They just couldn't quite figure it out. Or on the reverse, we have people that were great with the teams, but they, they struggled building those individual one-on-one -on -one relationships. So again, our thinking here is to teach leaders how to focus uh, on all three dimensions equally well to make that entire team work. The next question, we talked about focus. And so definitely when we say focus, it's like, do we focus on the individuals, the team as a whole, or the sub-teams? How do you know when to focus on one of those dimensions more so than the others? One of the key elements we talk about very early in the book is the difference between a team and a group. And most people use these terms interchangeably uh, and they really shouldn't. And in most companies, they call everything a team, even if it's not. But it's really fundament fundamentally important to understand the distinction here. The reason being that the 10 things you would do as a leader to make a team effective are very different than the 10 things you would do to make a group effective. And if we can't quite sort of figure out what we're, you gotta figure out what you're leading first, and then you'll know as a leader, which behaviors and actions to take to make uh, either one of these um, successful. The key difference, the number one difference between a team and a group is interdependence. And interdependence is just a fancy way of saying, the amount of communication, coordination, integration, and collaboration required between people to get their jobs done. If you don't have interdependence, you don't have a team. You most likely have a group. And when I share that information with executives, um, a lot of them have the same reaction, which is, oh, wow, hmm, I actually have a group, but I've been calling them a team, and I've been doing all this team stuff, no wonder they're confused because they actually don't really work together that often. The example I use with my MBA students, I always say we, we assign team papers in our MBA program. So you have four MBAs, they get together and write a paper together. And I always joke that professors figure out rather than grading 50 papers, they only have to grade 10 because they put them in teams. But jokes aside, I ask my MBAs, how do they write that paper? Like how do they go about, let's say I want it to be 12 pages, and I wanted to do in two weeks, how do those four MBAs write that paper? How do you think they write that paper? It's always the same. So typically what they do, if they'll admit it, is person A writes three pages, person B writes three pages, person C writes three, person D writes three, and then the night before it's due, they stitch it together in Microsoft Word magically, put a couple of transition sentences in there, and they turn that paper in. That's a group paper. That's not a team paper. And I'm not even saying that's the wrong way to write the paper. Uh, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that's not teamwork. That's group work. And so, again, fundamentally different. You see that in organizations, too. They're calling these things teams, and yet um, they're actually groups. And that can be confusing for people and also lead leaders to do the wrong things for these entities. If they were going to write it as a team, that paper, they might have a kickoff meeting, they might come up with a joint outline together, um, somebody might write the first two pages and send it to the next person and they critique it and then somebody adds some research and by the time they turn that paper in, it's changed hands dozens of times. And that's, that's teamwork, that's a team paper. The other thing I would say, a couple of differences that make teams distinct from groups. One is synergy. Does anybody have a working definition of synergy? How would you know if a team had synergy, what would you see? Because that is a fundamental reason you would put teams together is you're trying to create synergy. Anybody have a working definition? Productivity for sure. They make each other better. Yep. And there's a, I think that 
dictionary definition would be the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So somehow the team is able to accomplish something that can't be done by an individual or can't be done by a group, right? It's gonna take a team. In fact, if you don't have synergy, there's probably no reason to have a team. The whole point of bringing a team together is the team does more than what could be accomplished by an individual or a group. And the last one, uh, complementary skills. Uh, people, you know, you don't really wanna put a team together these days, especially with everybody thinks the same way, right? You want people with complementary knowledge and skills so that when you bring the complementary knowledge and skills together, you can leverage those differences and create breakthrough innovation um, and, and creativity. So those are other differences between teams and groups, not to be confused again. Um, question for you, if, if I were running a company here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I am, and I've been, all the people in my company work individually. They're all individual based. They're not working in teams, but I thought maybe it would be good for my company to move to a team-based organization, right? What's, if you were my consultants, what's the one question you would need answered before you could say, oh yeah, you should be, you should be using teams or no, 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 do not use teams. Keep everything individual based. What's the one question you'd want answered before you could say yes teams or no teams? Uh, what's the goal? Uh, Jessica says, why would you want to, why do you want to move to it? What expertise do you need? Yep. What would be gained by moving to a team-based environment, right? We don't want to assume that teams are going to be superior to individual-based work. In fact, sometimes it's not. So I would, I would actually ask all those questions, but the key fundamental question again comes back to what's the nature of the task? What is it that your folks are trying to do? And I would ask again, all those questions. And so in thinking about the nature of the task, I go back to that concept of interdependence. And even though interdependence is on a continuum from low to high, it's not a categorical thing, it's a continuum. I've kind of broken it down into three categories uh, for you. The first category is pooled interdependent interdependence. And pooled interdependence is a very low level of interdependence. It's quite like those MBAs writing that paper separately and then pooling it together at the end. In fact, I would probably call this more of a group here. And here I wouldn't recommend, oh, the example I give is insurance sales agent. So, you know, you have Allstate um, and you have uh, Geico and you have all these insurance agents out in the field in their separate offices selling insurance to consumers. And I often ask how much communication and coordination and integration and collaboration is required between the Allstate insurance agents in Raleigh to get their jobs done. There, there isn't, they don't, they don't need teamwork. In fact, that's probably a job that's better done by individuals working in a more group-like fashion. You know, all the money they make goes back to Allstate. So it is pooled interdependence but it's a very low form. And trying to force the team concept onto a task like this will probably do more harm than good. In fact, my, one of my gurus, um, he was at Harvard, Richard Hackman, and sadly passed away of cancer a few years ago. He wrote a book and in his book he said, I've never heard um, a symphonic score or read a great novel um, written by a team. And so, yeah, basically he was saying some tasks are better done by individuals and other tasks are better done by teams. And it's the wisdom to know which structure to choose that maximizes your chance for success. So again, here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this a team and I, wouldn't, I would not try to force the team concept onto tasks that look like this. And I always tell my MBAs, Next time somebody says we should put a team together to do something, just stop them for a second and say, does this task really call for teamwork? Maybe a subject matter expert would be better, or maybe a group would be better. And when people hear that I'm the teams guy and that I have a book on teams, they think that I'm going to say everything should be a team. And if the world were just one giant team, um, but th that, that's not true. So some tasks 
call for teamwork and some don't. So again, don't try to force it. Here is where this is an ideal situation for the use of teams. And it's called reciprocal interdependence because everybody depends on everybody else to get their jobs done. And I give an example of like a pharmaceutical R&D team. We can do um, hospital care teams. This is where everybody is coordinating and communicating and integrating with everybody else uh, to get their jobs done. So this is an ideal place to use teamwork. And the last one, um, there wasn't a name for this one. We had, to, we had to make up the word multi-layered because no one was writing or talking about this type of interdependence. This one gets pretty complicated because here you have a team with three sub-teams and there are at least three, I would call them layers of interdependence that a leader has to attend to. So there's these three individuals are very dependent on one another to get their jobs done. So we call that within sub-team interdependence, same here and the same here. But eventually these little sub-teams have to get together and exchange information, ideas, materials, whatever it is. And so we call that between sub-team interdependence. And then eventually this entire team has to deliver something to clients, customers, and usually the external environment. We call that across sub-team interdependence. So you can see how quickly it gets complex for leaders because leaders are having to focus on three different types of interdependence in a team like this. By the way, which one do you think gives leaders the most trouble? Which one do you think is the most difficult to manage? Do you think it's within sub-team or between sub-team or across? I got one vote for across, two for across. And Victoria says between. Yeah, I'm getting some more votes for between. Yeah, it is between. They're all difficult, but it is between. You don't, you know, these folks work together so closely anyway, it doesn't present a lot of challenges for leaders. They're already super interdependent. As far as across, if you don't deliver, a satisfactory product or service to a customer, you're gonna get fired. So across tends to take priority. It's between. And we call the the notion that these little sub teams kind of get in their own world and they don't wanna communicate and coordinate, and integrate with the other sub teams. We call those fault lines. So this team will be, can fracture, just like fault lines in the earth's crust where earthquakes occur. Same thing happens in teams these uh, little sub teams will kind of fracture apart from one another and they'll, they'll lose sight of coordinating and communicating. It gets particularly problematic if say these three folks are co-located in say France and these guys are in Argentina and these folks are in the US. And so that creates stronger levels of, of fault lines. When I talk about this material uh, to executives, they say, oh, it's more complicated than that because one of, one of our customers is on this team. You got to put the, draw the, the circle out towards the environment or they'll say well this person's on both sub teams so you have to have a, a line that crosses so this could get infinitely infinitely more complex um, as we go along but again these are the three things so here you would focus mostly on the eyes in your team here you would focus mostly on the team as a whole and here you would focus more so on the sub teams and how they relate to one another so that's focusing on what and when from a 3d perspective uh, I'm going to end this with a, just a series of questions for you. Uh, and then I want to take questions also from you. So if you were going to create the highest performing team possible, a team that would be in so successful, incredibly successful, the be all end all of, of team success, would you focus more on the design of the team? What's, what's on the left here? Or would you focus more on the way the team is coached and motivated? So if, again, what's the key ingredient here? If you're trying to create the most highly successful team possible, is it more about design or is it more about coaching? And you can only vote for one. Getting a lot of votes for coaching. 
Amira says, is this a trick question? <clears throat> kind of, yeah. So we're getting some more votes for design. So about 50-50. When I ask this question to my executives and MBAs, it's about 70% say it's coaching and about 30% say it's design. So let's look at the answer. The answer is both. So yes, it was, Mira, a little bit of a trick question. So here is a high quality coach and a lot of him and her, him, and her, him or her, and a high quality team design. That's the sweet spot. Uh, the best thing that can happen to a team is it's well designed and it's well coached. That's what you shoot for. But if you can only have one, so here again is a high quality coach, but a poorly designed team, uh-oh. So that's a problem. And if you look to the right here, you've got a really bad coach and a lot of him or her, but you have a well-designed team. Ah, you can still get moderate to high performance. So another way to say that is, I think more clearly, a well-designed team can survive a bad coach, but you can never coach a team out of its poor design. It's not possible. So the real answer, and this is based on tons of evidence that I and others have collected, that the most important feature is design. Any idea why you think most business people want to believe it's coaching? They really do. 70% 70, 70 want to believe it's all about coaching and they can forget about the design piece. Any idea why? Because I've asked them this question. Yeah, that's exactly right. Christine and Jessica, um, when you look at coaching, it's like things you can control that are under your control, your direct control. So you look at that and you say, oh, I can actually do those things. And then you look at the design piece and you're like, I don't have any control over who's on the team. I inherited my team. Uh, this is way too complicated. Uh, so when they say that, I say, I'm sorry. I don't have a workaround for you. I don't have anything to sort of make this a, a quick fix. It really is about design. Now, don't get me wrong, both are important. Both are important and leaders should do both, right? So leadership kind of is the umbrella that fits over both of these columns, right? Leaders design their teams and leaders coach their team. There is a bit of good news. We were able to rank the top six most important team design features from one to six. So the most important design feature is clear engaging direction. The second most is, is there interdependence, right? Talk about that. Is it a real team? Number three is, is there something in it for the team to succeed, right? Is there an incentive for the team, not just the individuals, but the team? Resources kind of goes without saying. Number five is basically empowerment. And number six is performance goals. That should make you feel better when you see the top six, because that is your job. As a leader, it is your job to make sure the team has a clear, engaging direction. It is your job to make sure it's a real team, uh, to make sure there's something in it for the team to succeed, to make sure the team has enough resources to empower the members of the team and set performance goals. So a little bit of good news here is that the top six pretty much are more under your control maybe than you think. The ones that aren't ranked, it doesn't mean they're not important. They're just not as important as the top six. So I think most of my leaders feel a little bit better when they see the, the six most important ones. But again, key lesson here is strive for both. But I think this is one of those slides that you know, people can use immediately when they go back to work because I ask them, when you go back to work and you're in a team meeting and that team is struggling, go back to this slide and use it as a diagnostic checklist. Go down each one of these and say, Where's the, what does the team have and what doesn't it have? I guarantee you a lot of the team problems you're having are design problems. Second to the last question, um, team size. How big, what is the optimal size that a team should be? I'll take your guesses in the chat. Mira says seven. Uh, Andrea says, is there one? Good question. Seven, six to 10, three to eight, five to seven. Five to 10, seven. So some convergence in there, probably averaging about five to seven. So the answer is, as it is with um, everything in my field called organizational behavior, uh, it depends 
uh, on what you're trying to get done, right? You want just enough to get the job done. But we do know that the sweet spot is somewhere between five to seven members. Why five to seven? Well, if it's only two or three, you probably don't have the breadth and depth and diversity of experience that you need to solve today's VUCA type problems. If it's 10, 12, 15, 20, that is not a team. Uh, people in companies always say, oh, my team is 30. That's not a team. It may be a team of teams, but going back to our definition of what a team is, interdependence, shared responsibility, mutual um, accountability, shared goals, 30 people can't have that. It's too big. So again, sweet spot right around five to seven for most VUCA type tasks. And lastly, a question, should all teams be diverse teams? And by diversity, I don't, I don't just mean uh, demographic diversity like age, race, ethnicity, um, gender. I'm also talking about expertise, function, background, experience. Should all teams be diverse teams? The answer to everything in my field, <laughs> once again, is, well, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So if you want creativity, innovation, breakthrough thinking, you'll never get that with a homogeneous team. You'll never get that with a team of people that all think the same way or approach problems from the same perspective. You ha have to have diversity. And every study that's ever been done uh, on diversity shows that. Right? And when somebody says, what's the business case for diversity? Like, well, we have tons of evidence to show that when teams are more diverse, they perform better on innovative and creative tasks. We also have evidence in, at the organizational level that when organizations are more diverse, they're more innovative. So there's a strong business case to be made for diversity. The only warning I give leaders about diverse teams is they're a little bit more challenging to, to lead from the beginning, to get them off on the right foot. Because diverse teams, people are thinking very differently from one another. And that can create some unhealth, sometimes unhealthy conflicts. It could create situation, situations where people, people don't want to say a whole lot. Um, they, might, they might hang back a little bit. And again, they're coming from things from totally different angles. So I would say that a leader has to work a little harder to make sure those diverse teams that, that he or she can harness and leverage that diversity for breakthrough thinking and innovation. In today's VUCA world, I'm gonna say that 99% of teams need to be diverse. So those of you that answered yes, um, actually um, are right because we're in a VUCA world. And so we have to have diversity um, there. And there is a question there too. I'm gonna throw up the lessons learned from this little session. And then I'm going to start taking some questions. Um, you can put them in the chat or you can also, we can use video as well. So that's a great question. So a, a, the question from Bethany is, does the benefit of diversity for innovation have a middle ground or is it a continual increase infinitely? Um, I think most of the studies are done in a kind of a linear fashion such that um, you would find pretty good infinite effects. But there, we've started to sort of in the last 10 years, most of our studies don't, we always assume that the more, more is better. Uh, the more empowerment you have, the more diversity you have, you know, we have this more is better kind of rationale. And then one of my colleagues came up with a term, didn't come up with it, but kind of borrowed it for, for organizational behavior, the too much of a good thing effect, that a lot of actual phenomena in our field actually start to have decreasing positive effects at extreme levels. I haven't seen that as much with diversity, but I have seen um, these sort of inverted U-shaped kind of uh, relationships between things that we thought would just be infinitely positive. Um, so the too much of a good thing effect can be at play with a lot of these constructs. And then we, th we think about diversity um, also related to team size. So you could say, well, we want to add diversity by increasing the size of the team. That can be problematic, right? If you, if you, if you want to add diversity by just adding more members, you're going to see declining uh, performance. In fact, the larger the teams are, the more chances there are for what we call social loafing or slacking, 
behavior, freeloading behavior. So that can be a problem. And, but if you had a small team that was super diverse, you're probably gonna see pretty good effects there. Victoria asked, do conflicts uh, also occur in a team sub team manner? Ah, a conflict between sub teams, does that occur? Is that what you're asking Victoria? So we spend about five pages of the book talking about how to help resolve those sub team conflicts because that's usually where conflict occurs uh, the most is between those sub teams. So some, I, I can't remember them all. I think there's probably 10 different strategies we talk about in the book. One would be making sure that leaders keep people in those sub teams focus on the big picture. It's kind of like having a superordinate goal. So they kind of forget about their differences and their conflicts and they have their eye on the prize, the eye on the big picture. So we talk about leaders um, creating superordinate goals to get those folks to be focused on what they're really there for. We also recommend, if you can, rotating the sub team members uh, across the sub teams, right? So that way you don't get too attached and too complacent in just one sub team, you're actually able to rotate. You can also uh, pair up members across sub teams to do special projects. So you can have a person from sub team A and sub team B and have them work on a special project together. Um, and also, you want to make sure that um, you can have a small number of sub teams also helps as well. The more sub teams you get, I think it can get a little bit more uh, complex, a little bit more complex. So that is, I think, one of the most important elements for a leader to deal with in a multi sub team system is how to resolve those conflicts. Great question. The worst setup you can have, generally speaking, is two sub teams. I should, I think I maybe misspoke. Yeah, two sub teams is the worst because when you have two sub teams, they can really sort of pull against each other. So there, there's probably one of those inverted U-shaped curves for that. You don't want 10 sub teams. You probably don't have a team, but you don't want two because that is sort of the either or uh, situation. So probably three to four to five sub teams would help alleviate some of that. And Christine is asking about things like, how do you resolve the sub-team conflicts? Do they apply in the same way for corporations and research teams? I'm thinking of the shorter shelf life team making the research team as compared to perhaps the industry team. Yeah, I, most of my teams, my research teams, we don't really have sub-teams in them. So there'd be like a team of four or five of us that are working on a research project and we kind of all working in more of a reciprocal interdependence fashion. I'd be interested to see, uh, I haven't thought too much about that, but if you had an, uh, a science team, research team, uh, I would imagine that some of this would apply, that ability to do that. Now, you're talking about people that have high levels of expertise, so whether you can rotate them effectively across the sub-teams, you may be pulling someone who's needed in a particular area of the project to someone who's not, so that's a little bit more complicated. But I have found that probably 75% in my work with science teams overlaps with business teams. And, and those, I think we, we joked about this last time, Christine, that there's a whole field devoted to science teams research. And there's a whole field devoted to business teams research. And those two groups don't talk to one another. They have no connection to one another at all. So I've been a little bit of a linchpin in various uh, arenas, trying to take what we know about business teams and sort of apply them to science teams and we're doing more, more, more of that now, and we're doing it more um, regarding virtual teams, right? Virtual, since we're all virtual now, how does this all play out uh, in a virtual environment? Yeah, Mira says, another complication for science teams when funding announcement requires stakeholder engagement and that they are to be a part of the team. Yeah, that's different. That's a different, different animal for sure. So that would be a disconnect from more of the business teams, yeah. Oh, I missed one. I missed several. All right, let me go back. Christine uh, is asking, can multi-team systems perform well if there are multiple leaders that focus on different aspects of the three dimensions of leadership, or they perform better with a single leader focusing on all aspects? So when teams get that complex, 
and if you had a bunch of sub teams within them, you're probably going to find little sub team leaders within the sub teams. So I would still want to have a single point of contact, a single leader that's accountable for that multi sub team system, but there's nothing that keeps that leader from appointing sub team leaders within those sub teams that help those sub teams coordinate and help provide, provide leadership. We have a section of the book on shared leadership. And we say that there's no assumption that 3D team leadership has to be, has to be a single leader. There's no assumption that one person has to provide all leadership to a team, particularly talking about the dimensions of a team. So I would sort of agree there that there are ways that you can create more shared leadership in a multi sub team system that could be, could be helpful. Uh, because again, in today's VUCA world, I always say that if you think you're going to provide all the leadership your team needs, particularly if it's global and virtual, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, Heather is, asks, I've been reading a bit about high performing teams, teams of experts, and the additional complexity of leading these teams. Yeah, that's a big one. Someone said earlier, egos can be a problem. And certainly when you have a team uh, put together on subject matter experts that are really highly skilled and talented in their area, it can be um, very difficult for leaders to do that. And again, I think I go back to the notion of, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the big picture goal here? Let's put the, the egos and, and I know better than you kind of aside in the interest of getting what we're trying to accomplish done. So, but I would agree, um, Heather, that, that, that it does add another layer of complexity. Um, because they are experts. I mean, that's what they are. They, they know what they know. And so it's hard to get them to, to maybe put their idea aside and go along with the team's idea, right? Because sometimes in teams, we, we don't get our first choice. We don't get our idea uh, advanced forward. It might be something that comes from another member or comes from the team. So that's a tough one. Uh, shared leadership, any advice on gently, that's key, advising the leader that this is a good idea. You know, I think a leader would be interested in that, although we have some leaders that are control freaks and micromanagers, those are the ones that would be the most difficult to convince. But anything that you could demonstrate to a leader that would help him or her to be more successful, if you can say, hey, I could take on this, this part of the project, or Sarah has a background in X, she could take on that part of the project. If you introduce it in a way that's sort of not challenging to the leader, not suggesting that the leader is incompetent or is not doing a good job, but more about, hey, we could take on some of this responsibility and the success of the whole team can be elevated, including that uh, of the leader. So it's kind of more of a subtle approach of, hey, we can take on some of this responsibility ourselves and, and make it more of a helping approach rather than any kind of putting the leader off or, or making the leader feel like they're not doing a good enough job, right? Then they'll probably get defensive. And again, we have a section in the book devoted to, to that as well. And again, with today's, the complexity of the teaming we have today, there's just really rarely a situation where one person can provide all the leadership that a team needs. And now we say, you're, again, you're setting yourself up for failure if you, if you think you can. So challenges that teams are having, Andrea, can you say more about that? Like, um, you like something wrong with their processes or? There are lots of diagnostic tools available out there. Um, things like what you saw here with my little design versus coaching, you can kind of use that as a diagnostic tool. And actually the last chapter of our book, chapter 10 is all just diagnostic tools the whole chapter is devoted to assessment tools that you can use to assess the team, uh, the leaders of the team and the members of the team. So there are lots of things out there. Oh, you could do personality. I'm talking about personality. We've got personality testing. We can do that. Uh, some companies will bring in a facilitator. That's their job is to help facilitate a, a team that might be having trouble. So third party could be helpful. A skilled leader could be helpful. Uh, assessment tools, and you can do team checkups. There are lots of commercially available tools on the market that sort of get a, a sense of where the team is, whether it's functioning well or poorly. 
Um, some of that would be self-report, other would be a, a leader report. But again, yeah, lots of things you could do to try to figure out what's going on with the team. And sometimes it's not easy. It's not obvious. There may be something that's not quite just there, out there. Yeah, do you find that bringing these things in at the early stage is better before you have any data? I would say yes, because um, I often say that teams left to their own devices can develop really bad habits and they develop them quickly and they're sticky. They're hard to change. So we look at these like team development life cycles, you know, like forming, storming, norming, performing, the ones that are out there. Um, I always say, where as a leader are you needed most? Where is, what's the most important part of a team's life cycle? And the answer is um, the beginning. The start of a team's life cycle is really, really important. And I often recommend things that can help teams get off on the right foot is a team charter or a team contract. And these are written documents that specify basically everything, uh, roles, how are we gonna make decisions? What are our top, the values that we're bringing into our team? And I have a great example, if you're interested, I've got a, a charter that we use with our, with our MBAs that I think works quite well. So things like the charters are great, uh, the tools that we have in our book are great. I'm trying to think, um, I'll think about it some more. I, I feel like there is a company that provides some of these tools, I'm, I'm missing the name, so I'll send it to the Christines when I think of it the monitoring assessment tools that, that we have. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that some more. Yep, Bethany says collaboration plans for sure, yeah. Anything you can do on the front end of a team's life cycle to get team members to agree on how they're gonna work together and what their norms are and their roles and their values is gonna go a long way towards helping team success. The, the longer you let it go on, and like you said, you might not have all the data immediately, but the longer you let that team develop those bad habits, uh, it's, it's gonna be a problem. It's very hard to change. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the slides to the Christines and I'll, I'll also throw in that team charter for you as well. So you can get it out to the group. Thanks, Bradley. I'll definitely send those out once I get those. And thank you so much for this really engaging webinar. It was really awesome. Um, I think a lot of us are going to have a lot of food for thought over the next few weeks. So thank you. And um, just to remind everyone, this will be um, archived on our website. And so you can go ahead and take a peek over there if you or send it to anyone. Um, thank you again, Bradley. And thank you for everyone for joining us. It's, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. totally, totally my pleasure. Someone's asking about the book. Yeah, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it anywhere, but just um, type in 3D Team Leadership and it'll come up. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Christine. I'll send, you this, <laughs> I'll send you this material right now. Sounds great. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Bye, everybody. Hey, Christine, I have just one question. Can you please share with us um, the slides? I know that you said you're going to send an email. Yeah, once Bradley sends them to me, I'll send them an email. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye now. Bye-bye.